my name is Ben Tretter and I work for Cambridge United Community Trust, which is the charitable arm of the football club here. Um, we're delighted this evening to welcome Eric Morangwa Eugene, MBE, to join us at the Abbey Stadium uh, to talk to us about his experience of the uh, genocide in Rwanda against the Tutsi, um, which is, of course, the 25th anniversary year um, of, of that event. We'll focus this evening both on the genocide against the Tutsi and uh, Eric's experience of that, as well as particularly football um, and what Eric's experience of playing football in Rwanda was before and after the genocide against the Tutsi. Um, it's a subject area of Eric's life that he said to me he gets less of a chance to speak about actually, uh, both, both his experience growing up and playing football um, and playing football afterwards. Um, so being at a football club, it's a nice opportunity to spend some time exploring that aspect um, of it. This event this evening is part of Cambridge City Council's uh, Hall of Course Memorial uh, event session, which has been organised by History Works. so we're delighted to partner with them, as well as Cambridge Ethnic Community Forum uh, to put on this event this evening. And it's also part of Cambridge United's uh, Kick It Out celebrations, which is uh, a charity that aims to remove all forms of discrimination uh, from football. So I'm just going to give a little context about the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsi, um, and then we'll move on to a, a, a conversation with Eric, but don't worry, you'll hear mainly from Eric rather than from me this evening. And at the end of that, we'll have a chance to uh, ask any questions you like uh, uh, to, to Eric. Um, so as I said, 2019 marks 25 years uh, since the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsi. You'll notice there that I'm using the term Rwandan genocide against the Tutsi rather than the term just Rwandan genocide. And that's because, of course, a genocide must happen against a specific ethnic group. And that's a debate that's actually happened over the last 25 years. And recently, the accepted version is the term the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsi. And that's something Eric and I will explore a bit as well. So what happened during this terrible event? So from 7th of April 1994, just under 25 years ago, for 100 days, uh, around one million of the Tutsi ethnic minority in Rwanda were killed. Uh, and this was done <coughs> by citizens throughout Rwanda, directed by the uh, political powers within the country, but it happened uh, citizens against often their own neighbours, and it was largely done using machetes and handheld weapons. Now it's important to understand here that the terms Hutu and Tutsi are terms that were constructed during Belgian colonial rule in Rwanda. So those are terms that have a relatively recent history within the country and became solidified in the years in between the end of Belgian colonial rule and the genocide against the Tutsi. So that's something again we'll explore what those terms really mean within Rwanda prior to the genocide against the Tutsi, obviously during the genocide against the Tutsi, and in the period after. So Eric was born in Rwanda in November 1975. That means at the time of the genocide against the Tutsi in April 1994, he was an 18 year old with a promising career in football ahead of him. Of course, a lot of that changed uh, as a result of the tragic events that occurred. So Eric, I just want to start firstly by taking you back to the beginning. What was it like to, to grow up in Rwanda in the period that you did? Uh, yeah, thank you, Ben, and uh, thank you everyone for coming to listen to uh, my story tonight. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> how, how was my growing time experience in Rwanda? Uh, well, I actually had a very uh, humble and comfort uh, growing experience um, uh, up till the age of probably 10. Um, I c c came from a, um, a working family. My, my, my dad uh, was a, a professional accountant and uh, working uh, as a, a, a senior a member of, of, of the organization he was working for at the time. 
Um, and my mom was um, a stay-at-home mom who basically looked after uh, myself and uh, my uh, uh, five other siblings. Uh, so we, we, we had a, a normal life. Uh, um, my, my, my dad, as, as a senior uh, member of, of, of the management of the company, had to move quite a lot because of where the company needed his expertise to go. And, and that meant, as a firstborn child, and, and <laughs> I really moved quite a lot um, in my first years. Um, I wasn't really aware of uh, the past complex history of Rwanda uh, because this was not something that was discussed in my home. Um, uh, things started to change or to become uh, apparent to me when I started school at the age of seven, eight, um, when the, Street, uh, 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 teachers used to ask students to stand up and line up on different lines in, in class and to stand on this side, who to stand on this side. Uh, it was my first experience to, to uh, actually understand that I might be different from my uh, friends and, 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 and classmates. Um, I, I think I remember it happened also to my younger brothers and one of my, my younger brother actually went to the Hutu side of, you know, and the te teacher obviously knew who, who, who he was, where he came from, and he said, no, you need to go to the other side. Um, so yeah, that became the first experience of I uh, mean, understanding uh, that uh, uh, I was I was different, uh, but didn't really fully understand that what that what that meant. If, if I, I can put that way, yes, I could tell that there were some of us who were called Tutsis and others who were called Hutus, but it didn't really mean much. Um, as I was then growing up and becoming more aware of, of, of what those terms mean, meant, uh, I started asking questions. Uh, why, why are we Tutsis? Why our neighbors are, are Hutus? What does that mean? And things like that. Um, and I wasn't getting any straight answers. Uh, because uh, traditionally Rwandans are very reserved people. They don't really give much away. Uh, and uh, the problems of Hutus and Tutsis um, were more serious also to the, to the point where it was impossible to, to, to really talk them talk about them in, in, a, in an open way. So Tutsis had pretty much learned how to live with the terrible past of, 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 of theirs um, without not having to talk about it. Um, my, my, time of, my time of growing up was in, 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 in the early 80s and uh, by that time, it, it had been almost 20 years since the first troubles uh, took place, um, because the, 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 the first really problem started in late 50s and then, then 60s and continued up till mid 70s, um, when then the new regime that was led by President Abiyarimana came to power pretending to be more sympathetic to the Tutsis, but not um, really doing it uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a real way, other than just uh, you know, playing the politics and saying things, but that were not uh, put into action. 
Uh, so though the, uh, the, the, the violence and, 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 and uh, serious problems that Tutsis had experienced in the early 60s uh, till the Habyarimana uh, regime came to power were not as much as uh, they were at that time. Uh, but the problems were still there. Uh, for example, the, um, the issues of uh, uh, discrimination that was based around uh, all sorts of uh, life, ac life ac activities in Rwanda, the education, the Tutsis were not allowed to go to uh, higher education. The Tutsis were not allowed to uh, get access to uh, government uh, jobs or even uh, uh, public uh, sector jobs. Uh, it was part of the national policy that people should have access to education, education based on their ethnicities. The bigger the numbers, the more places you have in, <laughs> to go to, to, to higher schools. People should have access to the jobs based on, the, on those quota, quotas. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that was the, the kind of experience of, of what was really going on uh, in my growing time. Um, but maybe that will be the second part of the question, but uh, I'll say a little bit about how then my introduction to football yeah, no, please do tell uh, us how you got involved with football. Yeah, it be, became very, very important uh, for me in a way that it played a role of basically uh, keeping me away from the troubles that most of my you know, fellow Tutsis were probably going on at the time. Um, I joined the club at a very young age, at the age of 11, 12, 13, and uh, became very known by, by the fans of my club, and the club uh, was and still the biggest football club in the country. Um, we, there is a belief that uh, nine out of ten Rwandans uh, uh, supporters of uh, Rayon Sport, which was the club that I was playing for. So that, that factor of me being part of this popular football club um, somehow gave me the privilege of not experiencing the, 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 the discrimination and the, 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 the daily harassment and many young, many young Tutsis and adult Tutsis were going, were going through. And when you were growing up playing in football teams from that young age, were you aware of which of your teammates were Hutu and Tutsi? Or was it much more focused around the team? Oh yes, but because I, I, was, I was already a grown up by, by, that, by, time, by that time, so I knew uh, who, who was who. And uh, they, they, they also knew who, who I was. Uh, but it was not really part of what we, we, we cared for, so it didn't really matter if you, you, you was a Hutu or Tutsi uh, as, a, as, a, as a player for, for the club. What mattered most was, was for us to play for the team and, uh, and then and, uh, win, win for, 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 the, for the team. Um, it was probably the only place in the, in, the, in the Rwandan society where the issues of uh, ethnicity was not given a huge importance because in every other area of, 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 of Rwandan life at the time, that was what mattered the most. If you were a teacher in a, in a school, the first thing that the head teacher wanted to know which, 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 which uh, ethnicity you belong to. If you were a nurse or a doctor in a hospital, that was what they wanted to, 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 to know. Um, 
in army you could not even get there because it was you know officially known that no Tutsis uh, are allowed to join the national army uh, so in a football environment it didn't matter or what ma that mattered was was uh, was 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 your skills how 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 good you are and um, the fans generally speaking didn't didn't also see that as an issue uh, <laughs> so it was an important issue for the fans your <coughs> It was, generally speaking, it, was, it wasn't, it wasn't. So the fans didn't really care which, 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 which ethnic group you belong to. Um, but there, there were, were some area of, of the country where, yeah, where those issues were pretty much important, even in the football environment. In the north part of, of the country, obviously, where the uh, most uh, members of the regime at the time uh, came from um, in, in uh, pro two provinces known, known they were known back then as Ruhengeri and, and, and Giseni and today they are known as Musans and, and the Rubavu. Um, those are uh, you know the the heart land of, of, of the most extremist people. Even the football clubs they are represented um, much more than just football. They, they cared about uh, which, which, which ethnic group you belong to before you played for them. The fans, you know, didn't want to see anyone playing for their clubs if, if he was not part of, part of, 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 of their, them. So yeah, we used to have a very, very tough time going there. Um, I remember we were attacked a number of times whenever we went to play in, in Rohingya or, or, or Giseni because um, partly some of us they they could tell that who who we were by the so-called um, uh, uh, looks of Tutsis or Hutus, um, but also the club I played for. But though the majority of players were Hutus when I was playing, but it had this um, label of being Tutsi's club. And why? Because it was f founded from uh, the former capital uh, uh, town of Kingdom of Rwanda. And the kingdom obviously be belonged to Tutsis <coughs> mostly. So this club, because it came from the town of Nyanza, was always seen as an uh, enemy's club for the most extremist Hutu people. Um, and whenever we, play, we went to play in the north, we really, really uh, faced a tough time. In the, the national police would be uh, mobilized to, to, to use all sorts of means to cause, cause us players and fans uh, a, a lot of troubles. Um, the referees will be put under pressure to, to just uh, find a way of uh, making us lose the game or, you know, things, things like that. So it, it, was, it, was, it was a bad experience football-wise going to that part of, of the country. Um, yeah. And in terms of moving into the period of the genocide against the Tutsi, yeah. what was your early experience of that? At what point did you become aware that this was a, an event taking part, taking part across the whole country? Uh, that became um, um, obvious that things were building up to a, a very s serious situation uh, uh, after 1990 uh, when uh, the war started between the, the RPF and the, the former Rwandan uh, uh, regime. The RPF, for those who 
don't know, um, was a, a rebel group that formed uh, from the second generation of Tutsis who were forced out of the country in the late 50s, early 60s. And they were, they were refused to, to, to return to, to their homeland for over 30 years. And um, then this young generation of Rwandans who went uh, in exile at a very young age, in one or two, and m most of them actually born outside of Rwanda, decided to, to use force to, 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 to come back to, to, their, to their homeland. And when that happened, it gave a good um, uh, excuse to, to the most extremist Hutu people in power to then go, go out and, 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 and put a proper plan of, of genocide in action. So they started doing things that were, were really clear that, that this is something serious would happen, even though no one really thought it would be a genocide. Uh, in fact, I don't think many people knew what genocide was at the time. Um, uh, on the, on the, uh, the, when the RPF attacked, more than 10,000 Tutsis were rounded up across the country and thrown in, in jail without any charges. In, any, they, just because they were accused uh, to be uh, so-called collaborators of, of, of the RPF. So every Tutsi who had a a status in a, in, in, a, in a community at the time, uh, pretty much went to jail. The teachers, the you know, nurses, doctors, uh, business people, they were all thrown in, in to jail for, for almost, they spent almost two years there. Um, that continued uh, throughout the next four years. And the uh, random attacks against uh, uh, communities where, more, where Tutsis were more uh, uh, happened every now and again across the country. Um, a number of people were killed during the 1990 and 1994. It was obvious something uh, would, would happen, though we never knew what be exactly. But at the same time, the fighting, the two fighting groups uh, had come to uh, agree to negotiate a peace deal. Uh, because the, the RPF uh, turned out to be very um, uh, organized uh, group, both political, uh, politically and militarily, they had captured quite a number, a big part of the country, and uh, they had campaigned uh, in international community, and all that uh, basically put under so much pressure to the Abyariman regime to accept to negotiate with them. Uh, so they had been going through what was known back then as a peace, uh, Arusha Peace Accord. Uh, which was meant to uh, establish a government of uh, transition where the RPF will also be uh, given some position in the government where members of the RPF rebel group will be uh, uh, brought into the Rwandan National Army. Um, it gave many of us hope that you know, things were turning into the right direction, things were going to be um, better than, 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 than what, was, what was going on at the time. Uh, but that negotiation period actually became a good time for the genocide planners to go and plan and notice what then we experienced in 1994. Because for them, they saw that as a, 
as a, as a, a betrayal uh, way of taking the power in, out of the hands of, 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 of Hutu majority, as they, they uh, always said. Um, and they even saw the president himself as a, as a, a threat, as, as someone who was betraying them, because obviously he, he, was, he was responsible for, for, for political negotiations, so he was blamed to be the one giving you know, the Hutus power away. Um, but I don't think he had any choice, so he, he was going to resist and maybe allow the, the war to continue and then lose, lose, lose by, by arms because he had, he had really been really losing so much. Um, the, the international community was putting him under so much pressure. Um, uh, but he was, uh, in my view, caught between you know these two situations that were very hard. And then, then though he also agreed to, to, to negotiate and eventually sign the peace accord, but he refused to put them in, into action. Uh, the dead, deadline of implementation of of the peace deal. Uh, I think uh, delay, was delayed for more than six months. So every time something would happen, and well, when when uh, so, uh, a deal was meant to to be signed, you know, uh, the time to introduce a new government would then move to next week, next week to next month. Um, so frustration was really. Uh, uh, building up from from uh, everyone in the country, and um, on April, on the night of April 6, and, uh, 1994, um, the head of state in the region had the summit in 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 Tanzania, Dar es Salaam. Uh, that was specifically to. Uh, put pressure on President Abdelimana to finally put in action the peace deal that had been signed for almost two years. On his way back from, from, uh, from this summit, that's when his airplane was shot down and he was killed. So as soon as the plane was shot down, We obviously knew something bad would follow, um, but what came after was even beyond any, anyone's imagination. Uh, because not at any time we ever really thought the mass population would actually be part of whatever that was going to happen. We always knew that. The police, uh, not even all of them, or the military um, and the, the, the militia groups that had been uh, been formed and, 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 and armed, would, would be the one that will cause us some trouble, but not our neighbors. Um, but that obviously didn't turn out to be the case, because as soon as the president, the airplane was. Uh, showdown, uh, the message to the Hutu people in the country was that um, you have to, ri to rise and defend yourself. The president has just been killed, and he has been killed by Tutsis. And if Tutsis can kill the president, who is next? Who else? will survive this. Uh, by th the next morning, the entire country was basically uh, under this uh, total state of fear. Uh, the Hutus uh, feared that the Tutsis were <laughs> genuinely coming after them. 
and they 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 had to stand up and then put you know protect themselves um, it's 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 crazy and stupid to, to to try and you know no normalize that because of the, why 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 would you would you just wake up and believe that someone you've uh, spend all, all, all your life with and you know helping you to go to 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 to, to hospital if you if you if you're sick attending your weddings and and your bath bath days and and and, and all, all those kind of stuff then would be someone who would come after you just because uh someone have has had say had say so on national radio but people did believe that and um yeah by april 7th in the morning uh, people were then going after their 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 old friends and neighbors and sometimes same family members and they are killing them tell us about your own personal experience of the events that then followed the 7th of April? So what happened uh, once that uh, terrible situation started was that um, I was actually watching a football match and the night the President Airplane was shot down. Um, I remember it it was during the, the African Nations Cup and that was taking place in, the, in the Tun Tunisia, 1994. So I was watching a, a football match on the television. Um, it's, I think it was, there were two games happening in that, on that afternoon. <coughs> One was, um, I think, Zambia against Mali. Um, and another one was Nigeria against another team, which I can't remember. Um, so I watched the first game uh, straight after the training. So we, we had been uh, playing in, the, in African competition at the time, and we were going through a, a very special uh, training program that meant we had to train twice a, uh, a day, which, which was not how how we were doing before, uh, but because of this uh, <coughs> African Nations Cup that was also happening, our afternoon training um, was brought uh, before for an hour or two hours earlier so that we could finish the training earlier and then go and watch the game. So we finished the training and then I, I went to watch the game at this pub or cafe in my in my neighborhood and uh, when the first the first game went into extra time um, and uh, when the extra, extra time came I decided to leave to leave the cafe and went to a cafe closer to my home because it was getting darker and at the time we knew it was always dangerous to be out and about uh, uh, at night. So uh, I left this cafe where I was wa watching the first game and went to the second cafe or pub called Baoba, which was two doors away from where I was staying. And I watched the, the second game there. And when I, the game ended, it was around 10 p.m. Kigari time. I made my way out and I was with my housemate and when we came out of the the compound of, of this 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 pub, uh, we saw a group of people, about six, ten, ten, ten people. Uh, the pub is right, you know, uphill in, in the Nyamirambo area, and where you basically have the entire Kigali city uh, in front of you, and the airport on the other side of the city. So the when, when we approached this group, we had 
someone in the middle of the group um, basically telling a story of what he had experienced or what he had seen. So he was talking about how he had a big bang and followed by a, a fire, a sort of a fireball. Um, but we didn't know why, what that meant. Uh, it was not unusual to hear in explosions uh, happening in Rwanda at the time. So we left and then went to, to, our, to, to our flat and then and, and just go to sleep. Uh, a few hours later, then you know, we were woken up by incredible noise of all sort of uh, guns, you know, bomb explosions, um, which was 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 quite unusual. Though, you know, we were used to that kind of things uh, because the country had been at war for almost four years. But that was very extreme than unusual. So we, we woke up and we tried to figure out what was going on, but we could not tell exactly what was going on. Uh, it was around 5, 5 a.m. when the, the, the shootings and the bomb, bombing had been going on since, uh, I think, uh, 2 or 3, 3 a.m. Around 5 a.m., that's, that's when we find out what, what was happening, when we uh, tuned to uh, some international radios, and then, and then we find out the news about the death of the president. Um, the next few hours, uh, we was uh, flantic and, and hearing news that uh, a neighbor that you knew had been kidnapped or had been killed. Um, and then read in the announcement on the radio came by 1 p.m. Kigali time. That's when uh, uh, a group of soldiers uh, came into my flat and uh, they, were, they were so aggressive, they just forced this, themselves in and then they uh, kicked, asked, asked us to uh, lie, lie on, the, on the floor. They were kicking us, going room by room, throwing things up and down. It was very scary. It was very scary. We really feared for our lives at that time. Uh, we didn't think we'd come out alive. Uh, but then something happened when the soldier, one of the soldier, uh, was uh, uh, caught by the 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 the, the, uh, the attention of photos that came from my photo album that had been thrown on the floor. And uh, he looked at the photos and then he recognized who I was by looking at the photos. He didn't, I don't know if he didn't recognize me or he didn't want to recognize me when he came in, but once he looked at the photos, he turned and to me where, where I was uh, sitting down on the floor and he asked me, are you Toto? And I said, yes, yes, I am, I am. And um, basically, Toto was my nickname. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Swahili word, meaning the young one. So it was a nickname that I was given when I joined the club at the, the young age of 11, 12. Uh, and it, it stuck, even, even today, some some people still call me Toto. <laughs> uh, everything changed at that moment. Once he realized he, he was convinced that I was Toto, I, he asked his colleagues first and foremost to stop what they were doing because they were still going around throwing things up and shouting and really intimidating, uh, pointing guns at, 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 at us. So he asked them to step out of the, the, the house. And then he sat me on the sofa, 
the next uh, 10, 15 minutes, we were talking about football. He was interested in uh, just talking to me about a game that my team had played uh, a couple of weeks earlier, uh, where we eliminated a football club um, from Sudan known as El, El Hilar, or El, El Hilar, yes, which was one of the biggest football clubs in Africa at the time. Uh, so we had eliminated them in uh, in African uh, club competition, where we would then have uh, uh, a ticket to go and play in the quarterfinals against a Kenyan team. That game happened a couple of weeks. It actually happened one month before the the start of genocide. It happened on. March the 6th, 1994. So the, the, soldier, the soldier had attended the game and uh, he was basically taking me back to all the key moments of the game. You know, you remember when you made this save, you remember when such a score that, that goal, you remember when the, the, the defender made the tackle. That was the talk. Now, went on between myself and this man who had actually come in, in my house to kill me. Um, that became the first real experience of uh, me being a footballer, uh, getting away with, with what, what, was, what, was, what was happening to, 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 to me. Um, so he then left and tried to advise us on how to go about the next few hours and hope, hoping that we will not be <coughs> um, uh, exposed to any danger of, of, of some of his colleagues who may be coming after, after him. Uh, he told us how to leave the curtain wide open leave the doors open. Um, I, according to him, uh, if any of his colleagues would just pa be passing by and saw those signs, they would necessarily be interested to come in because they would know that some, some, someone has, ha had already been there. It worked because no one came in for the next three, four hours because they were there around 1 p.m. They left around 3 o'clock. So we had uh, another three, four hours before the dark. And nothing, nothing happened. So they left. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone in, in my house was safe, was, was, was uh, uh, spared at the time, because um, we had a very young boy who was working as our house boy. He was a, young, a, a 16 year young boy from the uh, same village of my, my housemate. Uh, being a Tutsi, he had finished primary school and he had no chance of going to higher education. He had no other means, so he had to come to the city to find uh, something to, 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 to help, him, help him get on with his life. So he, he came and he got a job with, with us. Um, the, 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 the colleagues of this, the, the soldier who spared my life, when they went out outside the house, they then come across this young boy and they asked, they interrogated him. Uh, he didn't have any identification on him because he was still young to have a national ident identity card. He had to be 18 to have a national identity card in Rwanda. Uh, for them, they believed he was um, um, a, a, a spy or, 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 or an, someone who had infiltrated from the rebel group and was pretending to be there working as a houseboy, but he was, he was, he was a part of uh, the rebel group. They, they shot him dead.
he was the first person I saw I saw him being killed. Well, I didn't see him being killed, but I had the, the, the shogun, and then a and then few hours later, when I was also running out, away from the house, I passed his body lying just uh, by the backyard. Um, yeah, so the next uh, day I went to, to, to my house teammate. My house, my house teammate were Hutus, and at the time, it, it was dangerous to go in, anywhere near any, any Hutu. That doesn't matter if he was your, your friend or your, your neighbor. It, 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 was, it, was, it had been you know, made a national announcement that Tutsis and Hutus are officially enemies. Uh, but I decided to go and, go and, and, and try and seek refuge to the house of my teammates. And um, that, that, that decision has been probably the best ever decision I've made in my life. Because what went on after that basically contributed to how I survived the genocide. My teammate went out of their way to, to help me in, in, in an incredible, uh, you know, courageous, bravery way. Um, that 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 obviously gave me the chance to survive. They they provided uh, food because I could not get out of the house at the time anymore. Uh, they provide provided information that would help me to uh, run and hide whenever uh, a danger would be coming my way. And uh, in, at some point, they even paid their own money to release me from the hands of militians who had actually caught up with me. Um, and uh, eventually, when we realized that uh, they, they, there was no more they could do, they advised me to go and seek refuge to another uh, person who was also a key member of my football club. He was once part of the board of, of the club, but he was also the leader of the militias. The militia that were basically carrying the genocide over. Uh, he lived about half a mile from, from my teammate's house. And we, yeah, I was, I was told to go and, and, and seek refuge at his house because that was the last chance that we, I had. Um, once uh, this group of militia came uh, looking for me and then tried to take me away and then they were bribed and, and eventually they left, we clearly realized it was just a matter of time that uh, they, would, they, would, they would come back and take me away. And that's, that's how I went to this uh, member of my football club house. Um, my team, teammate vo <laughs> volunteered to uh, accompanied me there uh, because it was not safe and easy to actually move around. Every corner of the of neighborhood uh, was guarded by armed militias and you know ordinary members of, of, of the community who had now become pretty much part of the militia groups because uh, guns have been distributed to pretty much every Hutu house in a, in a neighborhood I had a gun. Or they, those who didn't have guns were, um, have been instructed to use all sort of <coughs> weapons. So we went to this guy's house. His name was Jean-Marie Vianem, Mudahenyuka. Uh, but he was um, um, known as Zuzu. Zuzu his, his was his nickname and very much known by most people in the, in the city. So we went there. It was an early morning, about seven-ish. Uh, it was always a good time to move around before uh, the barrier, the roadblocks, you know, would be 
more, more guarded and more dangerous. Um, so yeah, we, when we arrived at his house, my, my teammate Longe went, went inside the house to uh, basically speak to Zuzu on my behalf. And then a few minutes later, I saw Zuzu coming out of ha the house and he, he was laugh, laughing, laughing and they said, oh, um, I had been hit um, uh, during the, the attack of those uh, militians who almost took me away. And they, have, they had hit me with an object which had, you know, I don't know if it was a hammer or something, but it was a metal thing that they used to hit me and then I was injured and then I had um, uh, a plaster in, on top of my head. Um, and I think Longe had explained that to, to, to Zuzu when, when they were talking inside the house. So when he came out, the first thing he wanted to see was to see, he asked me to show him what, what, what was my injury, but I had my, my, my cap on. So I took off my hat and then they looked at it and he laughed and I said, how could this be possible? Who is this Hutu person who actually uh, managed to do this? But he was saying that in a very um, funny way. Uh, and uh, as a Rwandan, I, you know, we, we, we understood why, why he was saying what he was saying. Uh, basically what he was trying to say was uh, uh, the physical appearance of Tutsis and Hutus which was, which became the most important way of, you know, differentiating or separating Tutsis was that Tutsis were taller, uh, thin, and Hutus were uh, shorter and big, a little bit uh, big. So for him, why he was trying to insinuate was how could a short Hutu manage actually to reach the top of your head and with, with your height? <laughs> um, anyway, he was very much known to be the kind of person who always had jokes. Wherever he had, he always had jokes. Some jokes were out of this world, but he was, he was, he was known to, to be that person. Uh, but then he told, told me that, uh, Toto, don't worry, you're safe here. I will look after you till this all is done and we're going back to play football soon. And during that period, um, over those several weeks since the 7th of April, were you able to have any contact with your family or your, your friends apart from your football teammates? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, my family lived two doors away from my, my, my teammates' house. And, um, and uh, yeah, I was, I was very much in regular con contact because, because the houses were close to each other. Um, we used to jump over the, the fence and go, go to my parents' house and wherever an attack would be coming from my parents' side, people will run from my parents' side to, to my teammates' house. Wherever an attack would be coming from the other side, we then would run over to my parents' house. So, yeah, I was, I was very much in, in contact and, uh, and to some extent, uh, the, the help that I received from my teammates uh, impacted what happened to my parents as well. So you feel your teammates and your status as a footballer supported your family to, to some of them to, to get through this? <laughs> very much so, very much so. In fact, my, one of my younger brother later on also joined me at that house of my teammate. Um, and uh, then he was also helped with another teammate who was a Tutsi, but who lived with the, these other Hutu teammates to actually 
um, leave the neighborhood and then been, been taken to uh, a place in the city center where we, Tutsis had managed to go, go and hide in one of these cathedrals. Uh, so my teammates uh, arranged for this Tutsi teammate and my younger brother to actually be taken to that place. I had already left, but I came to learn about that later on. And my, my parents stayed there, stayed in the neighborhood for a long time um, until uh, I think June, that was almost two months after the genocide, uh, when um, someone came to warn them that a meeting had just been taken place to a, uh, to a nearby a road broke, because the road broke then had become the center point where decisions were made. Uh, initial decisions were made somewhere where no one knew. Uh, you know, people would come from different neighborhoods and they would attack the Tutsis. But later on, that, that power became local. So people within the local communities you know, became more influential and they were, they were making the decisions to who to, who to, 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 to attack, who to kill and things. So apparently a meeting took place at uh, this road broke and they, they decided that my, my parents were next to, to, to on the list. They were, they were pretty much the, the only one, they were the only two family left probably in the neighborhood. So someone, when that discussion was taking place, ran and came to warn my parents. And uh, as, soon, as soon as they heard about the news, they then ran to my teammate's house. Uh, they hide there, and within a few minutes, hundreds of people descended from that road block and came to my, team, to my parents' house. They couldn't find anyone. And then, then the anger was then basically put on the house. The house was brought down. Then, then my, my, my parents was two doors away. They could hear their, their, their house being uh, destroyed. So they stayed there overnight. And then uh, early in the morning, then they just decided to take a risk and, and, and take the road and go somewhere. But I, 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 to this day, I don't know if they knew where they were going, uh, but they just, they just went. And they went and they eventually made it to this cathedral in the city center where a number of other Tutsi, Tutsi families had managed to uh, stay. And, uh, <coughs> and they, were, they, were, they stayed there till, till the, the final day of, of, of war and genocide when Kigali was fully captured by the RPF on July 4th. And uh, yeah, they were, they were lucky to, to survive. So obviously you and the whole of Rwanda have gone through this experience of the genocide against the Tutsi. And then in the period after, in the years after, you then played international football for Rwanda. Yes. How does a nation come together after an event like that to produce a national football team? And what, what atmosphere can there possibly have been like within, within a team? <coughs> well, it's, it's very, very, very difficult to, to explain how that uh, could actually happen. But uh, personally, when I returned to my old place or my old neighborhood, but the place was no longer there, um, the first thing that I wanted to do was to play football. Uh, even though there was no life, um, buildings had been completely demolished uh, 100 percent. Um, road was still full of corpses of uh, 
many Tutsis who had been killed and dumped everywhere. Uh, neighborhood were completely empty because once the genocide stopped and the war ended with over a million Tutsis dead, the Hutu population also fled. They left the, the country under the guidance of the ruling regime who basically took the population with them. Uh, in what they were believing to be a tactical move. Uh, they moved from uh, capital city to the south of the country and then to the north and west, um, where eventually <coughs> France, which had been very supportive of uh, the, 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 the genocide regime, uh, intervened way, way later in, in, in the genocide, uh, around almost at the end of June. Uh, they intervened and they came and created uh, uh, what was known as a, uh, a tur tur turquoise, it's a French word, turquoise area. Uh, Oh, it was a turquoise operation, but then the area they captured also was given the name of turquoise in the west of the country. And there was uh, uh, about three or four provinces of, 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 of Rwanda. And the, probably 70% of the Hutu population of Rwanda at the time went, fled into that area. So it, that area meant that the RPF, which had now won the war, could not go into that area. The French created uh, um, a barrier there. And uh, it allowed um, the, the, the killers basically to run away. Um, but it also took uh, hostage many ordinary, you know, innocent Hutus who didn't do anything, who didn't kill anyone, uh, but because they were, they, were, they were told that if they stayed, they would be killed by, by the Tutsi RPF, so they, they, had, they had to free. Uh, so life, life, there was no life after the end of genocide and, and war, that's what I'm trying to say. But for whatever reason, I just wanted to play football again. And as soon as I came back in, in Kigali, I think it was around September, I started trying to look for my, my old teammates and, and, and try to put the team together again. Very few were still in the country at the time, but I managed to find, I think, five or six of them. And we started training, you know. Um, and another other club, that who had also few players and, and they also started do, doing the same. Um, partly because there was anything else to do. Uh, no schools, no, no more activities that was going on. Um, uh, but then the little actions that we took to come and together and, and train again um, motivated not only us players, but the rest of the people. Because the first ever public gathering that actually took place, other than the political uh, ones that you know had were, were taking place, trying to you know bring bring the the, the, the system uh, together again, uh, forming the new government and things like that. But the, the uh, first public event where people could come together in numbers was a game of football between my uh, former club, Rayon Sport, and uh, our, our biggest rivals uh, uh, called Kyovu Sport. And it brought uh, thousands of people. We, we, the game took place at the regional stadium of Kigali. 
uh, which no at that time had the capacity of about 15,000 people. Uh, we probably had three times uh, the number of people, the capacity. <laughs> people came from all over the city in, in some part of uh, uh, nearby towns um, outside the city to watch the game. And that game basically gave Rwandans uh, a sign of hope um, and gain, going back to normal life again. And, and it kicked off what then Rwanda had managed to, to, to achieve for the last 25 years. It was, a, it was an incredible sign of resilience um, that has now become a symbol of, 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 of Rwanda 25 years since the, since the genocide. Um, so yeah, we then got support from the new uh, political leaders in the country. Different games were organized. Uh, I think uh, the next few months they, they established uh, something called Peace Cup, something like that. Uh, that then brought together different teams uh, from across the country. We were able to travel from different parts of the country. That um, gave the rest of the population a belief that, you know, normalization was, 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 was there, you know, the, the peace was there, people could now travel from one part of the country to another, thanks to the football to tournament that was take, taking place. Um, he gave hope and, and, and belief for many Hutus who had been basically captured as, as a hostage in that part of the country as well as those who had managed to cross over to neighboring countries to actually believing that they could come back to their, to their country. And they did. Um, personally, I had a very, very uh, incredible experience uh, thanks to that uh, situation of, of, of going to play in this football tournament across the country. Uh, we went to play in Changugu, which was one of the uh, area where this French uh, uh, <coughs> uh, area had, had, had been created, but that, that, at that time it, the French had left and gone back, so it was, it was part of the of, of new Rwandan government. And we went to play there. When we arrived there, uh, Someone came to see me, and he told me that uh, there are three young kids who live in an orphanage in that town that had told the, told the, you know, the, the people who were in charge of uh, the orphanage that uh, one of their cousins used to play for Rayon Sport. So could they please find out if, if he may be still, still there. So the guy came to me and, and, and told me that. Um, these kids were from um, uh, my uncle's family who had been killed. The, my uncle and, and, and his wife and the three other children of, of theirs were killed. And they, only the three young girls, aged between, I think, four and 11, um, survived. And they were taken by a Hutu neighbor who fled the country. At, at the time, people were coming out of Kigari, heading to that direction where most Hutus were going. So they went with this uh, three kids cross over to Congo. Oh, ah, when they go to this bo bo uh, bordering town with Congo, they decided to leave these t 
two children in Rwanda, but the family crossed over to Congo. <coughs> and that's how these kids were uh, recuperated and put in an orphanage. And that's how I basically uh, discovered them, or they, they discovered me. Because once this guy came to me and then told me that this kid, this kid were there, um, after the game I went to, to see them. And, and then uh, I was able to arrange for, for, for them to be uh, brought back to Kigali where they eventually uh, reunited with some uh, uh, close family members. So, so that, 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 that is to say how much the power of football really played a part in rebuilding the country at the time. I went on to play internationally, both for the club and for, for the national team. <coughs> I was actually appointed a captain of the national team uh, post-genocide. And uh, going outside to play in neighboring countries or in other African countries uh, became more than just play, going there to play as a football team. We were truly the ambassadors of, of, of Rwanda at the time. All those people who had fled in those countries, for them to come and see us, the people who, who they used to know, it, 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 was, it was unbelievable to, to many of them because many of them had so much been um, uh, brainwashed that they didn't believe there was a any life in Rwanda anymore, or there was anybody living in Rwanda anymore. So to see me or my colleagues, who they knew before, changed them, gave them the belief that, you know what, there is still a country that is our country out there. They were, why, why can't we go back home? And we were always talking to them, telling them, you know, you need to come back. If you don't leave, think you've you had anything to do with what happened, there is no point of you staying here. And even if you've done something, you know, come and face justice. But uh, Rwanda had already been um, open to some kind of crazy uh, approach of reconciling, you know, the, the people. Um, we there was a an, a, a need of, of of not really looking back and 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 then and, and think about how bad things went. It was more about trying to see how they we could could do something for for for, for future. Even those who had done terrible things. Uh, yeah, they, they, were, they, were, they were given a chance to, to actually get away with it. Uh, so yeah, as a, as a football, footballers, we, we played, we played a, quite a big, a big part in that process of reconciliation and, and then the reconstruction of the country. I've got one more question and then we'll mm. open it up to any of the audience who'd like to ask mm. anything. So you touched on it a little bit there, but tell us a bit about Rwanda today. How has Rwanda move forward from 1994 and what, what does the country look like now? Uh, well, I'm glad that there are f uh, few people who have been uh, in Rwanda in audience here. I've, I've chatted to two or three of them. Uh, they can definitely be, be my witnesses. Um, uh, Rwanda has changed beyond anyone's imagination. What happened in the last 25 years was never anything that I personally uh, thought would, would, would happen, let alone the, the development and the modernization that has taken place, but being able to bring the two communities to live side by side again, it was, it was, it was, it was those, you know, Things that you would n you would not really think it was it was going to, to, to be possible, but efforts were put in place, and um, 
forgiveness was was encouraged and then it has taken place um, reconciliation has genuinely been 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 implemented and uh, people have reconciled in a in a very genuine way and then that that has allowed Rwanda to be where it is today uh, Rwanda is today pretty much uh, a leading country in almost every area of, of, of social development uh, and economic development in Africa um, put aside the reconciliation and, 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 and everything that has taken place. Today Rwanda has the highest number of women representative in the parliament in the entire world. For a country where uh, rape was used as a, uh, a weapon of genocide, we pretty much uh, three out of five women Tutsis and girls were raped. It's, it's, an, it's incredible to come from there and be, be in a position where you, you now have uh, so much representative women in a position of power. Uh, the cabinet is actually 50-50. So it's a 50 female, 50 male cabinet. There is policies in place that it's mandatory to have a certain numbers of women in higher position of, 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 of the governance of the country. Uh, when the genocide happened, the life expect expectancy of a Rwandan was 28, 28 years old. Today is close to 70. Uh, There is, there is so much that has happened. Uh, I always say that um, genocide was a terrible experience, but it, it has uh, allowed us to rediscover who we were as, as people uh, and, 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 and have, have used that terrible experience to genuinely um, build a country that, that is, is fit for the Rwandan spirit that have, we've always had, we always, uh, uh, no, we, didn't, we, didn't, we, don't, we, don't write, we didn't write much, but there is so many tales that, you know, says how incredible Rwanda was I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the old days. That spirit has, has, has been able to be rediscovered after genocide. Um, no one today is, is discriminated based on his looks or his so-called ethnicity. You can't be stopped to go to uh, higher education because you are Hutu or Tutsis or some, something else, uh, or if you, because you are a, a woman or man. Um, yeah, so Rwanda, Rwanda, is a very important lesson for, 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 for the rest of the world. And that, that is one thing that motivates me to, 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 to do what I do today, um, because I genuinely believe what we have experienced and then how we've, 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 we've managed the, the, the aftermath of, of what happened in Rwanda, it's a lesson to the world that can genuinely help many communities and societies, um, especially now we're going through all these issues in, in different parts of the world and in, in, in a society where we uh, have believed for a long time that we, we, we are uh, immune to, to this kind of uh, crazy and stupid behavior of, of dividing ourselves uh, yeah it's, it's, if, if, if you visit Rwanda 
you come back a changed person and I'm sure those who have lived who have managed to visit Rwanda here would, would, te would tell you so uh, because it's a, it's 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 incredible and, and you know uh, dramatic enough to listen to what I'm telling you now but to then they, they see go there and see it and live it, it it's, 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 it's it's something something else and that's what it is to, 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 to experience if you, if you go, you, you visit Rwanda. So yeah, Rwanda, Rwanda has changed beyond belief. But it's a long process. It's a long process uh, for us to genuinely believe that we will not go back to those d dark days. We still have to invest so much, uh, especially in the young generations. Reason why my foundation exists um, I tell my story, I share my story because I want young Rwandans to learn from the past um, mistakes of the history and, and not to, to, to ever repeat them. Well, thank you for that message of hope there at the end. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes for any questions because we've uh, overrun slightly on the tour, but I felt it was really important to hear um, from Eric as he um, so brilliantly retold his story. So if anybody does have any questions they'd like to ask, please do uh, take your opportunity now. Yes, we've got two, so I'll go back there and then Hi, to you, Eddie. Yes. Actually, which is where I was oh, hello. hello. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, what does Ishami mean? An easy question, I hope. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking. Yeah, I should have said that uh, way before. Ishami, Ishami is, is a Kinyarwanda word meaning tree branch. Oh. Uh, and um, I, I've had the organization that does what, what, what we do for, for almost 10 years, but it was not called Ishami. Uh, it was originally called Football for Hope, Peace and Unity. Isham is a new name that we, uh, we uh, gave to the new foundation about two years ago when we were trying to reorganize and, and, and do things that we, we, we really thought were going to be m more meaningful. Um, so we came up with the, the name Ishami. Um, a tree, as you know, is a sign of life. Um, a, a branch of the tree, uh, it, it's, it's what gives a tree a purpose because that's where the, the, the fruit, uh, you know, comes from and then the, it's the fruit that gives the, that meaning of life. Uh, given the background history of Rwanda and us survivors of genocide, uh, we, we believe we, we, are, we are three branches. We basically, we've, you know, grew up from this uh, uh, tree of different experiences, um, but we, we are now branches that are producing, you know, these this, this, this right messages of, of hope, of peace and reconciliation and so on, which, 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 which is what we really need if we are going to have um, life going. So yeah, that's, that's it's, it, it mean, means connection, it means uh, resilience, it means, yeah, it means more than just a tree branch, but uh, really it, it, it's a tree branch, uh, Isham. Yeah. Eddie, yeah. Um, it was actually exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does anybody else have a question? <coughs> yes, so we'll just take two questions mm. and then uh, we'll finish up. So one there. Just is there. Would it be good just to mention what's going on with cricket in the land? Cricket? Yeah. Cricket? Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, I will try even though it's one game that I know nothing about. Uh, yeah, cricket is, is, is one of these new things that have happened in Rwanda after the genocide. We, 
I don't think any Rwandan actually knew what cricket was before 1994. Um, but since that, we've had a number of uh, Rwandans who grew up in uh, English-speaking uh, countries who, who had connection to the you know, British uh, culture, and cricket being part of a British culture. And then they, when they returned to Rwanda, they brought the, the, a game of cricket with them. And they, it has become one of the most fast growing sports in Rwanda in the last, in the last 25 years. And I am actually sometimes amazed to see young Rwandans on the street with the batting and then they say, what is going on here? And um, it's, it's something that has also been helped a lot with the Conservative uh, Party uh, because uh, uh, we had a very few uh, Conservative MPs who find out about the, you know, the, 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 the interesting story of recovery of Rwanda and then they forged some relationship with some, some Rwandans and, and then they established this project which was known as uh, a Mahoro project, Omuwano project, which is friendship project. Then uh, conservative part, uh, MPs would travel to Rwanda every year during their recession time and then they would spend a week or two weeks in Rwanda working in the communities, building schools, uh, uh, make, working, you know, creating other activities. And they been very supportive to, to promote the game of cricket. And uh, we now have probably the most beautiful stadium of cricket in the world that uh, was, was, was uh, just recently been uh, opened by, by um, uh, yeah, the, these these friends of Rwanda from 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 uh, yeah, Kosovo team. Yeah, because when we were at the Oval Town, he was yeah. there on the line with the. All, all the prime minister, not just even the David Cameron, and, and then yeah. yeah, so they 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 were all been there. Yeah. There you go, Rwanda and cricket. <laughs> <laughs> the final question there. Yes. Um, you said that your father yes. was a, an accountant. Yes, he was. Um, around Jalaki Tori, but you also said that you were not allowed access to higher education. So how did yeah. you get around that problem? Well, he was one of the few. Uh, my father came from a Seven Days Adventist Church background, and uh, he lost both his parents at a very young age. In fact, he doesn't know both of them. Um, so he was a very bright young boy. And when, when he finished uh, primary school, this, you know, it's seven, seven days Adventist, uh, Adventist church community noticed this young, bright boy from poor background who had no one to, 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 to support. They helped him to go to uh, higher education in, in, in a school that was under the control of uh, Seven Days Adventist Church, which was a college, one of the best colleges in, in the country at the time. That's how he made it to the, to the higher education. And um, when, when, when his generation finished, finished the, 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 the high school, uh, it was the first time the uh, accountants was also in, established, introduced in Rwanda. So they had this special school that was going to uh, train the new accountants in the country, uh, he, they had to go for the most bright one, the brightest people, and because they needed people with skills. They didn't need, need, have to look for, for, for which, which uh, groups you, ca you come from. So he was then sent to this uh, 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 accountants uh, training for two, two years uh, where he became, became a a professional accountant, and then and a new project was introduced in Rwanda with the help of uh, uh, European Union that was working uh, in collaboration with the Rwandan government to have this project. And uh, 
the people who recruited the, the, the senior staff of, of this project, most of them were Europeans. So they were looking for skilled people. They were not really bothered about where you come from. That's, that's how, how he ended in his position. But he was later kicked out once the company uh, became fully controlled by the government. And uh, uh, yeah, that's when he lost his, his job in 79 or 8, something like that. Great. Well, thank you very much, Eric. I'd just like to, before we uh, thank Eric, just like to briefly invite Eddie Stadnick, who's the Chief Executive of Cambridge Ethic Community Forum, just to, to sum up. So, Eddie, do you join us up here for a minute? Mm. Um, I think this is a story which, um, for me, is very poignant. It's sad, it's tragic, but at the same time, it's incredibly, ultimately positive and uplifting. Um, it's a triumph of the human spirit over adversity when we have something in common. Um, there is an old adage that uh, when evil prevails, when good men do nothing, and clearly there was evil, um, and overwhelmed, there was a darkness there, but there was still some good men, um, which was good and very positive ultimately for yourself and, and your family, and we got through this somehow, which is an incredible miracle really. Um, it's also, I think we're on the topic of, of, of the genocide and the Holocaust, and um, I believe paraphrasing that um, in Talmud, um, it says that if you save one person, you save the world. And I believe that the people that saved you ultimately saved the world because you have gone out and you have, you're a living example of how the world is saved. Um, what I would say, um, we work in a situation <coughs> which is, has relative harmony, but there are a lot of issues bubbling beneath um, the surface. That hatred, that malicious evil, doesn't just happen. It, it's, it's something that clearly in that environment, it was building up and building up. There was many different factors that just required a catalyst, something just to spark and it just fired off. Um, and I think until you go through something like you've gone through, you you don't really appreciate. Um, sometimes we call it political correctness. Sometimes we call it free speech, when in fact people are being, some people are being irresponsible and are actually, uh, it's hate, hate speech. Um, and I don't think people realize sometimes how all these things build up and build up until a particular situation is created where it's possible for people to, to do the things that they did there and have done in other parts of the world and even recently. Um, so I think it's just being aware of that and I, and I think you're a positive force for change. Um, and I'd commend you um, for what you've done because you, you didn't have to. And what you did was you brought people together, you brought your community, your country through a healing process. Um, and I think sport here has been that common factor, very uplifting, very positive. Um, and thank you very much, Eric thank and you. Ben and Helen for um, bringing, bringing us all together. A, a very unique, very special um, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks, Eddie, for summing it up so brilliantly, so I won't add any more. Um, and just a final thank you, Eric, for sharing your story with us um, and with the world. Um, so thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you.